The U.S. history of anti-communism and its deadly impact from Asia to Latin America and beyond. Hello, I'm Anand Naidu and this is The Heat. Since the end of World War II, the U.S. has fought communism around the globe. And from Brazil to Indonesia, that has resulted in hundreds of thousands being killed. Journalist and author Vincent Bevins brings new insight to the story in his book, The Jakarta Method. Its subtitle is Washington's Anti-Communist Crusade and the Mass Murder Program that Shaped Our World. The book takes us inside decades of CIA and U.S. government intervention. And joining me now via Skype from Sao Paulo is the author of The Jakarta Method, Vincent Bevins. The award-winning journalist has covered Southeast Asia for The Washington Post, and he's previously worked for The Los Angeles Times as its Brazil correspondent. Vincent, welcome to the show. Yeah, thank you for having me. Before we get into the specifics, the title of your book, The Jakarta Method, what does that refer to? Well, the Jakarta Method is the intentional mass murder of innocent civilians. And this is done in the Cold War for a very specific purpose, to construct white right-wing U.S. allied regimes. And the apex of this story is in Indonesia 1965, when the U.S.-backed military killed one million innocent people. And this was one of the most important successes of the Cold War, such an obvious success to other allies of the U.S. in around the world that they copied methods from this mass murder in, in South America, especially. And so this is, uh, they named that Plan Jakarta, Operation Jakarta. So the, the, the method was based on this horrible massacre in Indonesia in 1965. All right, let's talk about Indonesia. It's a country that was colonized by the Dutch. It was also invaded by the Japanese. And if we look at the aftermath of World War II, uh, we had the Cold War, of course, but President Sukarno wanted Indonesia to be independent. He wanted it to be uh, neutral. He visited the United States. He met with the president here in Washington. He also visited Moscow, met with Khrushchev. What kind of future did Sukarno want for Indonesia? So, yes, yeah, Sukarno, we forget this now, but Indonesia, the, lar the fourth largest country in the world by population, was led by Sukarno, who was one of the most important leaders of the Third World Movement. And we think these days of the Third World, we think in negative terms, but the Third World Project was a very optimistic, forward-thinking plan to bring together the countries of the formerly colonized um, continents, Africa, Asia, and Latin America, to change the rules of the global order. And they wanted to do this not by aligning directly with Washington, not by aligning directly with the Soviet Union, but taking their own path towards a more developed, and independent future. Now, in the early war, early years after World War II ended, the United States thought that they could tolerate Sukarno and this movement in general. Uh, but as the 1950s um, came around, the United States changed their attitudes towards Sukarno, and they started uh, a number of schemes to either get rid of him or to crush the left in his country. You know, I read the book. It's a great book. I read it in two days, actually. It's very readable, and it's full of facts. Uh, you note in your book that the U.S. strategy uh, since the 1950s was to destroy the Indonesian Communist Party. Why was the U.S. Yeah. so focused on Indonesia, and where did it focus into something known as the domino theory? Well, yeah, so Indonesia was by far the most important country in Southeast Asia, far more important than Vietnam. Just, I mean, if we give value to the domino theory, uh, Indonesia was a much larger domino than Vietnam could ever be. And as I said, Sukarno was spearheading this global movement, which was really, you know, shaking the global order and had the potential to, to transform relations between nations. And the Indonesian Communist Party, one of the oldest communist parties in Asia, founded before the Russian Revolution, uh, very moderate compared to what people think of as a communist party now. They always were unarmed. They were winning elections. And we know now from declassified files that what bothered Vice President Nixon at the time in the 50s is that they were going to win because they were so popular. So they were not tricking people into winning elections. They were just being the best organized and doing the best outreach for the Indonesian people. So in the, uh, this is a real problem for Washington. Not only is this country trying to change the global order, but there is a large communist party which is getting more and more powerful. And in the middle of the 1950s, they start really trying to take down the PKI, as it's called, the Partai Komunis Indonesia, in any way they can, and to get rid of Sukarno in any way they can. 
And there was an assumption uh, that any communist party anywhere in the world would automatically be subservient to the Soviet Union. Yes, yes. I mean, this was this is part of the anti-communism that I outlined that um, powers so much of U.S. foreign policy in the second half of the 20th century. The, the kind of fanatical anti-communism that powered this foreign policy is not the same as simply not being communist or is being opposed to it even. It's a very specific way of viewing the world in which no one could be even moderately socialist in the third world without being automatically assumed to be subservient to Moscow. Now, this was not the case uh, in many, many cases. Sukarno himself was never a communist, though he did tolerate and allow the uh, Communist Party to operate in his democracy. And as the Indonesian Communist Party grew into the third largest party in the world, they had so many members and they were so confident in their own way of doing things that they didn't really feel the need to take orders from anybody. They were um, concentrating on getting mass membership of the party. So by the middle of the 60s, they had 25 to 30 percent of the country either affiliated with or really in the party. And it, it just it was just wrong that anyone around the world that called themselves a socialist or a communist was part of some international plot to destroy the United States. Sukarno tried for a very long time to maintain good relations with the United States, and it became very clear that was no longer possible. But it, it, it's, it's certainly what he wanted. There was no reason for him to want to pick a fight with the most powerful nation in history. Now, in uh, 1965 and 1966, there was a massive onslaught against the communists in Indonesia. You refer to that in your right. book, and you say it was a coordinated program of extermination. In total, it's estimated that between 500,000 and to 1 million people were slaughtered and 1 million more herded into concentration camps. How deeply was the U.S. involved in that? Very deeply. So there are still major things we don't know about exactly when the idea came about to carry out mass murder as the solution to the problem of the PKI, the Indonesian Communist Party. But we knew that Washington had been pushing to get rid of the PKI for 10 years. So in 1955, they tried to bribe a conservative Muslim party and tried to get them to win elections. That didn't work. In 1958, the CIA bombed the country directly, trying to break it into pieces. That didn't work. In 1964 and 1965, we now know that CIA and MI6 were agitating behind the scenes using the covert operations technologies available to them to try to cause some kind of a clash between the left and the right in Indonesia, knowing very well that the right would win because the right was the U.S.-backed military, which had weapons, and the left was unarmed party. Now, to this day, it is mysterious how exactly that clash came about. But what we know very well is that as soon as General Suharto used this clash to take power of the country, shut down any media that would contradict his propaganda, spread pop propaganda blaming this clash on the Communist Party. The U.S. assisted at every step of the way. They were very excited about what was happening. They encouraged more violence. They provided material support when necessary, but it was, it was very little was needed because this was, they were in such a strong position. And then later, we have one um, piece of testimony from a State Department official who worked at the embassy in Jakarta who said that he gave lists of quote-unquote communists to the Indonesian military so that they could be killed. And this was seen universally in Washington and in, in, in mainstream U.S. media as a major victory for the West in the Cold War, and it really was in, in a very terrible way. So these lists were actually supplied by the U.S. government to the authorities, to the military in Indonesia? Yes, this is what one member of the State Department staff says. He said, quote, I have a lot of blood, on, I probably have a lot of blood on my hands, unquote, but he didn't think it was a problem. But even after that testimony has come out, more and more declassified files have shown us exactly the back and forth that's going on between the embassy and, and, the, and the, their leaders back in Washington. They know very well what's going on. They're encouraged by what's going on. They're encouraging more violence. And they're getting very detailed reports as to just how horrible it is. Yeah, in fact, in the book, you do refer to the strategic victory that the U.S. won in Indonesia. And uh, I have another quote here in which you say, in just a few months, the U.S. foreign policy establishment achieved there what it failed to get done in 10 bloody years of war in Indochina. Uh, the U.S., of course, ultimately withdrew from uh, Vietnam. So how important was this victory in Indonesia? Incredibly important. And I think the reason, one of the reasons it was able to fall into the sort of the back of our collective memory and to be forgotten is because Vietnam was such a catastrophic and problematic 
quagmire for the United States, but it was very well understood by officials in 1965 that once you had Indonesia, that was what you really needed. And so Robert McNamara, for example, in his memoir says that he, looking back, he realizes that they didn't really need to win Vietnam because Indonesia was what really mattered. And ultimately, if you look at the shape that Southeast Asia took, and you know, in, in a much broader sense, the, the shape that the, the Third World took, the, the West was ultimately victorious. And, and I spent a lot of the last three years speaking to the victims of these specific interventions, not only in Indonesia, but the, the related violence around the world. And if, if, if you ask them, it's very clear whose world we live in now. We live in a world created by the ultimate and, and sometimes terrible victory of the United States in the Cold War. Right, Vincent, uh, going back to that period, let's move to Latin America. The U.S. was also engaged there in coups and support for right-wing governments. The U.S. launched a campaign in 1954 uh, to overthrow the Guatemalan leader, Jacobo Arbenz. Uh, why did the U.S. really care so much about what is a relatively small country in Central America? Uh, this is quite a horrible piece of um, historical documentation that we have. The justification for removing Arbenz at the time was communism, right? Uh, they, he had some links to the Soviet bloc. He was going to be a threat to Washington. We know now from declassified files that they, this was not the case. They knew this was untrue. What Washington, um, what leaders said in the State Department was that the real problem was not any kind of a threat from the Soviet Union. The Soviet Union had no interest in provoking Washington in Central America at the time. The worry was that his his moderate capitalist reforms would be successful and inspire other countries around in the region to copy him. They, the United States, of course, um, unlike in Southeast Asia, had a very, very long history of intervening in Central America, often using direct military invasion to do so. And when it, it seemed that Jacobo Arbenz was stepping too far outside of what was allowed, and if, and if it was seen that he could do that, and even worse, do that and succeed in helping his people by by challenging U.S. corporations and challenging power in Washington, that would be unacceptable. So the intention there was as a deterrent. If you can do it, we don't want other countries to do it. Yeah, I think that a new global order was taking shape in the wake of World War II, and I think that American officials, in the broadest sense, thought that it was a good thing for the world. And if you got, if they saw somebody getting too far outside of the boundaries that were being created in this new order, they felt the need to smash them back in. And if they could smash them back in, great. If they ended up just smashing them, that tended to work too. And in the case of Guatemala, I mean, the, the long-term consequences of the 1954 coup are absolutely horrible. The civil war started not a few years, only a few years later as a direct consequence. Hundreds of thousands died in a, in a civil war in which US-backed military carried out horrible human rights atrocities. Uh, human rights violations and atrocities. And it's something that we forget too often in the United States, because it seems like a long time ago. But if it happened to us in 1954, I don't think we would forget about it. And, and Guatemalans don't forget about it either. And then in the mid-60s, you had the overthrow of the Brazilian president, Brazil, the biggest country in South America, uh, Joao Goulart. He was also known as uh, Django. He was overthrown. What role did the yes. U.S. have in that? So this, was a, this is a very important distinction, I think, that I end up drawing in the book, is that in the 50s, the CIA kind of really comes in and breaks things and makes it very obvious that they are backing a coup. In Brazil, a lot more of the regime change was done by local Brazilians. And the United States was active in the scenes, behind the scenes the whole time, letting him, letting the Brazilian military know that if you did this, we'll, you'll get away with it. We will provide you support if, need it, if you need it. And there was something called Operation Brother Sam, in which uh, Lyndon Johnson's administration made available naval um, military equipment to the Brazilian military if they should need it, but they did not need it. They had enough support from the middle classes and the elites in Brazil to take this over. But if, if, but you can listen to a recording of John F. Kennedy authorize his ambassador to lay the groundwork for a coup in order to stop quote unquote communism. And that groundwork was laid, was laid very, very effectively uh, in, a, in such a way that when it came down to the final moments of the coup, it was not the United States very visibly pulling the strings. They, they had, they could sit in the background and be very satisfied with, with the outcome.
And something that you write about in the book, in that this kind of behavior by the United States was practiced by not just Republicans or not just Democrats, both sides did it. Yeah, I, of course there are differences between every administration, but if you really take a step back and, and writing a historical book like this allows us to, allows me to do so and reading it, I hope allows a reader to do so. If you really look at it from a global perspective, and if you were to ask somebody in, say, Chile or the Congo or um, Indonesia, is there a difference between the way that Democratic and Republican administrations conducted themselves towards the third world or the, what used to be called the third world? And I don't think that they would, they would tell you that they experienced a difference. And, Vincent, when you look at what was done by, say, President Johnson, later President Nixon, and even President Reagan, um, how did that come to define U.S. foreign policy? Well, the, the Cold War continued to be the prime concern, and this was very obvious to people that were on the wrong side of it, right? And so you had a brief period of detente. Um, in the early 70s, and, and Reagan really came back to unapologetically back any, any opponent of the Soviet Union. But what I think is really important is this new global order that takes shape in, in, in the wake of, of World War II. And, and there is a, continu a continuance from 1945 until the end, end of the 20th century to making sure that that order um, is born and remains stable. And, and the use of anti-communism as a justification was often very uh, important. And sometimes it was really what they believed. But in the end, you got the creation of a US-led capitalist system, which is not what people in the third world thought was going to happen. You know, When I met the people that were involved in the third world movement in the 50s and 60s, elderly Indonesians or elderly people from other parts of Asia, they really thought that they would be taking their place on the world stage alongside the rich white countries, you know, colonization is over, so we will have our own say and we will catch up. Now, that didn't happen. I'm not saying that the reason that didn't happen is because of these interventions and because of the mass murder that U.S. allies carried out, but I do think it has to be part of the story. One final point, uh, Vincent, and that is, you know, this was the, the height of the Cold War. Um, it seemed that through all of this, you know, the Soviet Union, which was the other major power at the time, seemed impotent, uh, especially uh, if we look at Indonesia and Brazil. Uh, why do you think the Soviet Union did not oppose the United States more vigorously while it was going about this? I don't think that they were necessarily impotent, and nor do I think that they were less willing to violate human rights. I think that they, were, they had strategic delineation. So, of course, in the parts of Central and Eastern Europe that were conquered by the Red Army in the end of World War II, the Soviet Union insisted on absolute control. In places like Latin America, often Soviet le leaders understood that that was the, the backyard of the United States and they didn't want to provoke them. So at many points in the Cold War, the official line coming from Washington or from Moscow, depending on where you were, which kind of a communist party you were in the world, so Chile and Brazil are good examples, what the Kremlin was telling you was, no, just, per just be a moderate participant in social democracy because uh, our strategic goals do not align with any kind of provocation of Moscow at the time. Now, of course, in other parts of the world, closer to home, this was very different. But they were not, they did not see it as in their best interest to be everywhere, especially when it could provoke reaction from the United States. Vincent Bevins, author of The Jakarta Method. Vincent, thanks so much for joining us. And for more now on U.S. efforts to defeat communism over the years, joining me via Skype from Washington, D.C., is Harlan Ullman. He is the chairman of the Kilowen Group and senior advisor to the Atlantic Council. Also with us, too, via Skype from Washington is Max Blumenthal. He is a journalist and founder of the independent news website, The Grey Zone. Thanks to both of you for joining us. Harlan, let me start with you. Much of what Vincent Bevins writes about in his book underlines the deadly impact of U.S. policies. Looking at those policies in hindsight, uh, what was the U.S. rationale for them? The United States took, United States took its policies of what happened in World War II and determined that communism was the equivalent of fascism. And so anti-communism became the cause, celeb, that really dominated policy, especially in the Eisenhower 
administration with the Dulles brothers, John Foster and Allen. And in many ways, we overreacted. We believed that the Soviets were 10 feet tall when they were only five foot eight, with not all their vital organs developed. And at the end of the day, that got us engaged in Vietnam under the Kennedy and Johnson administrations, which really showed the folly of the anti-communism and the degree to which we really exaggerated the threat and overreacted to it, in my judgment. Why do you say it was a folly? Because we should have known better. We decided that the Soviet Union were the enemy and that anything that they did, we had to counter and that we're going to use all means fair and foul. As you know, the Dulleses came out of World War II and the Office of Strategic uh, services OSS and decided that this was one way that we could deal with them. Uh, Eisenhower had a better idea with his notion of massive retaliation, which is to say that the nuclear imbalance or the nuclear balance really provided a stability in which peaceful coexistence could break out. But unfortunately, other policies that engaged us in the Middle East and elsewhere uh, made that very, very difficult. And so as a result, we became engaged in Vietnam. I'd make one other point. Well, the Bevan book talks about the horrors in, in <clears throat> Indonesia and in Brazil. Uh, similar horrors were going on in the Soviet Union and China, as well as in Cambodia. And so the problem here is that humanitarians or slaughter is, is a humanitarian catastrophe that's been ongoing for a long time. And we've now found, we've not found any way successfully of dealing with that. All right, let me bring in Max. Uh, Max, what about the argument that's made by the United States that it was engaged in a Cold War, that it was fighting communism to protect American interests and, in U.S. words, to preserve freedom? Well, I, I agree with the guest. Um, you know, the, the response by the U.S. foreign policy elite, um, especially the Dulles brothers, uh, was did result in an enormous amount of folly. And... You know, as we see in Vincent Bevan's book, which I haven't read, I've read excerpts of it and um, reviews of it, um, it did not exactly lead to the U.S. supporting freedom. Um, you know, it led to um, the CIA handing over lists of communists in Indonesia to death squads um, and supporting a dictatorship. Um, and this is what we saw across the global south, wherever the U.S. sought to contain Chinese or Soviet influence. And it's really fascinating when you actually look at John Foster Dulles's behavior. I mean, this is you know the creator, one of the creators of the OSS during World War II. Um, as David Talbot illustrates in his fascinating book, The Devil's Game, John Foster Dulles was actually a Nazi sympathizer who was used by um, U.S. federal law enforcement as a kind of dangle because he was constantly hanging around Nazis before the U.S. entered the war. And he was used to get a sense of what the Nazis were up to. Uh, after the war, you know, we saw with Operation Paperclip and several other operations, the, the rat line, the U.S. actually importing Nazis or bringing Reinhard Galen into West Germany, who was the former architect of the Gestapo, to set up the West German BND, the West German Intelligence Services. So, I mean, it's resulted in, I think, uh, and it continues to this day, um, the U.S. supporting quite the opposite of freedom, um, as the U.S. maintains a special relationship with countries like Saudi Arabia and Israel in the Middle East uh, to contain Iran. Harlan, most, uh, if not all, of the countries involved uh, at that time that the United States was involved in were developing countries. They were called third world countries at that time, before that term became a derogatory term. Um, what did all that intervention achieve? Very little, unfortunately. Um, the, the issues are that America uh, has been too much dominated by a combination of culture and crusade. Uh, the crusade in Europe, obviously, was Eisenhower's victory during the Second World War, but we continued that cruise in terms of anti-communism, and we continued uh, that view of uh, crusade when we entered into the Middle East and Iraq the second time under George W. Bush. So there's always been a sense of crusade as part of American policy, which in many ways has led to great danger. And during the Cold War, make no mistake, anybody who was against communism was on our side. When we founded NATO, Spain, Portugal, and Turkey were not democracies. Fortunately, they became so. So in those days, anyone who was opposed to the Soviet Union was going to become an ally of the United States. 
And remember, for much of that period, from the late 1950s on, we believed that there was a Sino-Chinese, a Sino-Russian uh, consortium, and that these two countries were really linked together. And unfortunately, that was a huge misinterpretation, misinterpretation which in part led us into Vietnam. What we really needed then and need now is a much more rational, uh, object-based foreign policy that deals less with ideology and facts. And unfortunately, a series of administrations since the Cold War ended and since George H.W. Bush's administration have failed to do that, Democratic or Republican. Max, if we look at U.S. policies at the time, to what extent have those pol policies continued? I mean, look at Venezuela right now, where President Maduro accuses the United States of trying to overthrow him. Yeah, and the, and the question is not just the sort of um, dictatorial means that the U.S. applies on the world stage. The U.S. just listed the first lady of Venezuela as an international drug dealer, um, but who the U.S. seeks to support in place of these um, actually elected governments in the case of Venezuela or Nicaragua, where the U.S. seeks regime change. I mean, I've reported from these countries, these are governments that have large popular bases, um, much larger than their opponents. But what the U.S. has done since the Cold War is actually set up uh, methods of infiltration that are deeply undemocratic. I'm speaking about the ironically named National Endowment for Democracy, which seeks to do, according to one of its founders, what the CIA used to do in secret, um, you know, during the Cold War. And so now they openly fund opposition groups. Um, the U.S. worked with a group of Serbian students who were trained by the CIA to train Venezuelan anti-Chavista youth activists like Juan Guaido and his mentor, Leopoldo Lopez. Um, the U.S., through USAID, funds various civil, what they call civil society groups. And they basically have used these groups to stir up what are known in Washington as color revolutions, right. but are really seen as destabilization campaigns now in, taking place in Hong Kong. Um, and this is all in the name of containment and regime change, the same policies carried out during the Cold War, but done so overtly and with the um, express approval of Congress. All right, Harlan, I've just got a minute left, and I'd like to get your view on this. What do you make of it? Uh, has American policy changed? I mean, we look at Donald Trump right now. He has a policy of America first, an inward-looking policy. Uh, has it changed? Obviously, it's changed, but some of the some of the wrong principles still are at play here. We do, we believe too much in the ideology that we are really on the side of right, and our opponents are not. And so, therefore, uh, one of our greatest weaknesses has been a failure to understand, have sufficient knowledge about the international environment. That has been dominated by a sense of crusade, and an ideological perspective that more or less has continued. It takes different forms and shapes. But until we get a better understanding and more knowledge of what's really happening, I'm afraid the United States could blunder along courses in the, as it has in the past. Harlan Ullman, Max Blumenthal, thanks to both of you for joining us. And that's it for this edition of The Heat. I'm Arnold Naidu. Thanks for watching.